Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today in War Thunder we're having a look at the aviation suggestions which were passed to the developers in April of 2020. Another thing I just want to mention before we get into this is I'm going to be live streaming uh, one of the alpha tests for Enlisted today. Uh, so if you want to check it out, make sure to check out the Twitch channel. And the alpha test is available all weekend for Enlisted. Uh, en Enlisted is the new FPS uh, which is designed or combat simulator which is designed by Darkflow Software and also published by Gaijin uh, so make sure to have a look at it uh, if you haven't at enlisted.net anyway let's have a chat about what was passed to the developers aviation style there's a lot of weird and wacky stuff this uh, month and uh, I kind of like it in ground forces uh, there is a definite theme but at least in aviation it's a little bit all over the place and we start off with the F5 Tiger II or not just the F5 Tiger II, but some specific variants, the F5E, the F and the N Tiger II, which uh, as uh, Ranch Source 39 says here, he labels as an international lightweight heavy hitter. Uh, so let's get into its history. Let's talk about what the machine is about and how it would generally fit in War Thunder. So generally, when we talk about the history of this machine, what we're having a look at is the design d uh, dates back to the 1950s. It was initially developed by Northrop under their own initiative as a low-cost, low-maintenance tactical fighter bomber primarily intended for export. It gained a reputation and popularity for being simple, reliable, and also for still having good air-to-air performance characteristics and entering the export market in 1964. Four. The F-5E Tiger II was a further development from the earlier F-5A Freedom Fighter, and it was an evolution of the original design, which was developed for the IFA Fighter Competition, and due to the new export requirements of needing an export replacement for the F-5A um, the fighter that was able to, to compete better with later model MiG-21s, the F-5E Tiger II ended up winning the IFA Fighter Competition, in 1970 by a wide margin. The general improvements from the F5A were being powered by better engines, the General Electric J85GE21s, and it also had uh, 5,329 uh, pounds uh, or 2,185 kgf of afterburner uh, thrust. It had an auto flap system for the machine. It had increased wing area uh, owing to changes in wingspan and shape of the uh, leading edge extensions. It had an arresting hook. It also had a new uh, pulse radar, the ANAPQ-153. It also changed air navigation equipment, weapon control, increased in fuel quantity, and also an increase in diameter as well. The late production F5E and F models uh, also included a different radar, the the ANAPQ-159, and also a revised cockpit uh, front dashboard to allow fitting of a radar warning receiver and uh, also a few other uh, notable differences, mainly in the general uh, computing of the aircraft itself. There was also the F5F, which was a two-seater variant of the F5V, and the F5N, which uh, was a U.S. Navy designation for 35 F5Vs acquired from the Swiss Air Force, uh, which got unique designation due to features inherited from the Swiss version that were not on the prior F5V and F1s, and the addition to to planned upgrades the USN had in mind. Uh, when we have a look at the general armament of this machine, what we're looking at is two 20mm M39A2 revolver cannons, 280 rounds per gun, so this thing could definitely pack a punch. It had seven hard points in total, uh, three pylon stations, uh, and uh, Sorry, it had seven hard points in total, two uh, on the wing tips, and then four underwings, and one on the under fuselage pylon station, uh, carrying uh, which could carry a capacity of about seven thousand pounds. And uh, this would be either in the form of hydro rockets, in the form of zunis. It could also carry AIM-9 sidewinders or AIM-9 M's, and also uh, Mark 80 series of bombs, and also. 
it could even carry a bunch of drop tanks. So this was pretty much your all-purpose fighter. And uh, yes, it was also able to be used uh, for bomber configurations. And it was used uh, by a bunch of different countries uh, because it was so successful. It was another one of these vehicles which was uh, highly used uh, by a bunch of other nations such as Ethiopia, Iran, and also Saudi Arabia uh, in certain war zones. So it definitely saw a lot of service and would be lovely to see in the game under the American banner or maybe as a premium for another nation. The next one we're going to have a look at is uh, by Pony51 and this is talking about the Rustal Kramer RK344X4. Now you may be asking what is this thing? Well what you are looking at is one of the first air-to-air -air missiles that was ever produced. It was the first manually guided uh, air-to-air missile and it flew in 1944. And yes, it was those crazy Germans uh, which were able to build this and it also had one of the first proximity fuses which was used in combat and it was actually based on audio of all things, uh, which is kind of interesting. So uh, Dr. Max Kramer at Rostal, who you may have heard of because he was behind so many different things, things when it came to these wacky and interesting ideas uh, began work on the X-4 in June 1943. The idea was to build a missile with enough range to allow it to be fired from outside the range of a bomber's guns while being guided with enough accuracy to guarantee a kill. So the X-4 met these specifications and more. It used the BMW 109448 rocket motor, uh, accelerated the missile over 1150 kilometers per hour, um, which was about the same speed as the Werfer Granet 21 and also the Folding Fin R4M rockets. And it was kept there during its cruise uh, between 1.5 and 4 kilometers, uh, while the defensive guns had a maximum effective range of about a thousand meters. So the whole idea of this was to create a weapon which would render uh, defensive gunners from stuff like B-17s completely useless. And the missile was spin stabilized at about 60 RPM, or one rotation a second, so any asymmetrical thrust from the engine or inaccuracies from the control surfaces would be evened out. The signals to operate uh, control surfaces on the tail were sent by two wires, uh, which unround from bobbins housed within long bullet-shaped uh, fairings, and then cells mounted either on the roots of an opposing pair of a larger mid-body fin, or on one uh, one pair of those same fins, opposing fins. So these uh, contained a total of about 5.5 kilometers of wire, and the wires were controlled by a joystick in the cockpit. There was a gyroscope as well, which kept track of the uh, control inputs from the pilot's joystick to the launch aircraft, and this was obviously translated into yaw and pitch as the missile spun, and flares attached to two of the midsection wings were used to keep the missile visible through the smoke of its motor. The warhead uh, actually consisted of a 20 kilo <laughs> fragmentation device. This had a lethal radius of about 8 meters and it was thought that the guidance system would allow the pilot to get the missile into this range uh, in terms of pitch and yaw and at the range the missile could operate it would be almost impossible to judge range to anywhere near this accuracy. And for this reason the missile mounted a proximity fuse known as the Kranich, and this was an acoustical system which was tuned to the 200 hertz sound of the B-17's engines in cruise, and uh, obviously activated by the Doppler shift as the missile approached, the trigger range was about 7 meters. So, this thing was literally tuned to the audio uh, sound of the B-17 engines. So this was completely designed just to annihilate B-17s and nothing else. Now, obviously, uh, the reason why you haven't probably heard about this too much is even though it did see uh, some success in testing, uh, there wasn't it wasn't really exactly used in many combat missions. There are reports of it used in combat missions. The most sources say that the 
the X Force what the X Four was uh, deployed to fighter squadrons for use, but it never had a chance in combat. But according to the RAF Museum, there were some used in combat, but there are no guaranteed kills with it. It was also seen to be mounted on Fokker Wolves and also Ju eighty eight, uh, which seemed to be the uh, general users of the uh, machine of the uh, missiles. But yeah, it's just one of those things which would be kind of really nice to see. Uh, when it comes to it there are a bunch of vehicles that technically could uh, have this on so Dotu 17Ns, ME410B1U2, the Focke Wolf 190A or the TAR 154 also the Dotu 17Ms and Ks, the ME410B6, DO335s, the ME262 uh, could even you know have this thing so there are many candidates in the German tech tree to be able to put this on but I'm a little bit dubious of how useful it would actually be and also at the end of the day how useful it was in actual real life since the uh, the uh, the information around its actual usefulness is very shrouded the next one we're having a look at is from super cacti and this is for a 55 millimeter cannon which was a development of the mk 108 uh, the germans wanted to go bigger and better and let's just say it didn't really work out but you know they were on their way to doing it and here is just a model of an me 2 which was designed with it. So, what was going on here with the MK112 55mm cannon? Well, the MK108 mechanism was scaled up uh, to the MK112 uh, using a 55 uh, by 175 RB cartridge. The MK112 was intended to be fitted in pairs in the nose of ME262 fighters with 25 rounds per gun, and also the nose and later models of Arados for night fighter duty, and also under wing mounts for the DO335. So this was very much a late war uh, gun. There was only 15 prototypes built, 10 were delivered for tests, and 5 were kept at the factory for improvements based on expected feedback, and of the 10 delivered, 7 were of an early model, which weighed 300 kilos, and 3 were lighter, 275 kilos. Uh, these were both significantly lighter and also slightly smaller 50mm caliber ones and they had a 21 round armed uh, bore cannon uh, series BK5 cannon which itself weighed 540 kilos and the projectile of the MK112 was supposed to be 1.5 kilos with 420 grams of explosive filler. The US actually captured some of these prototypes and they used um, them as a kind of uh, they use them for information for building their own experimental 57mm T78 autocannon, but that never went to production either. Now, what you see in front of you is a proposed variant of the ME262, which would have housed a 55mm gun. This would have been based off the A1A U4, which we see in game, the Polkistora, and uh, yeah, it would have just had it in the nose. There was also plans, as we talked about, for the Do 335 and the Arado to hold this thing but they never came to fruition there was also plans to mount it on the p1101 but guess what that also never came to fruition because the thing was never fully built and uh, another thing to also mention uh, at this time is um, one of the really interesting things for me is reading or listening to or trying well not listening to but reading um, the interviews that Goering did after the war because he was uh, actually, you know, he was interviewed by a bunch of uh, U.S. generals about, you know, what the Luftwaffe was doing and, you know, what were the plans. And he said in those that the 55mm cannon was never finished. Uh, it was never ready for production. It wasn't ready to go. And he also said some, <laughs> he also said some really interesting things, which I think is uh, fair. You know, it's, it's worth listening to if you can find like an audio version or worth reading, uh, you know, if you just find the stuff standard version. The next thing we're having a look at is the Manchu Key 98 and this is from Fufu Bear and this is a Japanese wonder weapon that never saw the light of day. So what is it? Well as Fufu Bear puts it, it's a high altitude twin boon fighter. 
And uh, this um, machine actually goes back to 1942. So the Koku Humba, uh, which or Hombu, sorry, which was Japanese High Command, they needed a bunch of different fighters. And one thing they definitely needed was a high altitude machine to be able to deal with all of the bombers uh, that they <laughs> saw uh, coming over uh, at the time. And they needed to basically get ahead of the curve. So even in 1942 and earlier, they were looking for stuff to be able to address the situation. And so what Mansiu did is they attempted to address this need with the design, and by 1943, the design was finalized and it was sub it submitted to the Koku hum Hombu. And to their surprise, the design was actually accepted to serve as a high-altitude fighter. There was going to be a few modifications to it, uh, but one of the changes uh, was to include a better engine and also a safer way for the pilot to be able to bail out. And after the, de the design was finalized, a prototype began construction. Uh, but unfortunately, the construction was never finished uh, by the end of the war, and uh, the engineers who had built it decided to destroy it to prevent its capture, uh, which unfortunately happens with a lot of Japanese aircraft. So the thing is, uh, we do have its designs, uh, but because it never uh, it never was fully built and it was never flew, it's one of these Japanese wonder weapons, uh, which of course uh, means that everybody wants it for some reason. And yes, it does make its uh, wonderful uh, appearance in uh, one of the books which I despise, uh, which <laughs> which is uh, Dwyer's oh sorry Edwin M the Third uh, Dyer Japanese Secret projects, experimental aircraft of the IJA and IJN, uh, first edition, and that's because it's the same book which talks about the three variants of the R2-Y2, even though they didn't even build a full fuselage of one of them. But yeah, there is a bunch of pictures of what the machine is supposed to look like. Uh, the specifications are written out, but uh, all I have to do is read the performance parts to make you understand uh, what is... The <laughs> what these are based on. Based on my feeling, I do think these estimations are for rated power and not takeoff power. So yeah, based on feelings, we can throw it out the window. These are not proper stats. Uh, there is no point. But yeah, it was supposed to have 137mm into 20mm in the nose, and, uh, you know, obviously a twin boom uh, pusher aircraft, which would have been fun to see, but unfortunately never built. The next vehicle we're having a look at is from Zero, and it's the HE-111A-0, or as it was known eventually in China, the HE-111K. And uh, so this is obviously a German aircraft, and for a brief, uh, um, for looking at uh, this machine, it was a pre-production model of the HE-111, known as the HE-111A-0. It was based on the V3 prototype, and the plane that would eventually become, obviously, the Luftwaffe bomber um, in World War II. But in the original form, the Luftwaffe was disappointed in the performance of the A-0, and this was down to the fact that it used 578 horsepower BMW 6 engines. And uh, the, the HE-111 that was actually accepted into service was one which had much better engines. It had uh, it was the V5 and it had 900 horsepower DB600As, uh, which eventually became the HE-111B. But there was a delegation uh, that came from the Cantonese Air Force, who visited Germany and were interested in the HE-111A-0. So they purchased around six to ten of them, and uh, they were sold to the Royal Cantonese uh, Air Force at the time in 1936, and they were used as bombers and trainers. And uh, according to some sources, it was redesignated the HE-111K. And their combat service uh, was between 1937 and 1939. Didn't really do a lot. Uh, most of them got shot down or damaged beyond repair. And by 1940, there was a single plane that survived. 
It was put into storage, and then in late 1943, it was taken out of storage and re-engined with Wright Cyclone 1820 radials and uh, relegated to transport duties. So, and then it was uh, damaged uh, beyond repair in a crash towards the end of 1944. The picture you uh, see in front of you is that one which uh, was re-engined. Uh, so this wasn't the original one, uh, but this was the transport uh, version, which, you know, we uh, talked about. So, yeah, it would just be a very early version of a HE-111 in the Chinese tech tree. It would at least be unique, and yes, it was used by the Chinese. The next vehicle is is the Machi MC-99, uh, and this is another crazy prototype from the Italians, <laughs> and uh, it was, this is from Milo Cat. And the Mackie or the Machi MC-99, it was a torpedo bomber, a flying boat, developed from the earlier Mackey MC-94, uh, which was a civil passenger and transport aircraft. The MC-99 was a high-wing flying boat, so primarily wooden construction, and with a twin tail and two engines mounted above the wing, it was capable of carrying 1,500 kilos worth of bombs or two torpedoes for anti-shipping duty. It had a crew of five and was protected by three turrets, had a nose turret, which had two 7.7mm, a dorsal turret with either a 7.7mm or 12.7 machine gun, and an open tail position mounting a 7 7 machine gun. There was only one constructed, and it was flown in 1937 and evaluated by the 170A squadron at the Regia Aeronautica, but it never entered production. So this was just another one of those flying boats, which was a cool idea and would be really nice to see in the game. I feel like its bomb load is a little bit higher than, uh, you know, it makes sense to have. Um, just because of the fact that it was a prototype, but I feel like it would be a really cool addition just because it has, you know, it's one of those weird and wonderful stories which did exist, so it does make sense. The next vehicle is from the Germster or Jumpster 91, and it's talking about a plane that's already in the game, uh, but obviously in a different tech tree. This is the Douglas DB-7. Now, the Douglas DB-7 is already in the game in the British tech tree as a, uh, ca as a premium, uh, I suppose, from the French. But I suppose it should be represented in the French tech tree as well, since it was mainly supposed to be used for France. So the Douglas DB-7 uh, was the most produced attack bomber uh, during World War II. This also includes its, uh, you know, its... Uh I suppose you'd call it its progression, the A-20 Havoc. There was a total of 7,477 DB-7s and A-20s built overall, mostly by Douglas, and 380 were built at a Boeing plant in Seattle, uh, Washington as well. Uh, the Havoc, of course, was a mid-wing, twin-engine, three-place medium bomber uh, that earned a reputation for getting its crews home, uh, even when both crew and aircraft suffered crippling blows, and it was called the Boston uh, when it's service with the England, uh, with the uh, British Royal Air Force. It uh, entered production uh, when, despite official neutrality in 1938, uh, there was little doubt in the United States as a country, um, you know, it would be able to support its allies, Britain and France. So the French saw the secret bomber project at the Douglas Santa Monica, California facility and ordered the first 107 DB-7s to be delivered to the French uh, Purchasing Commission at Santa, Mon Santa Monica uh, in October, and then there would be deliveries made by ship to Casablanca, which eventually would go to France. The French then ordered another 270 DB-7s, but uh, before the fall of France in June 1940, half of them had been accepted, but many were still en route, and 16 were diverted to Belgium's Aviation Militaire, and the rest of them to Britain, where of course they served as Bostons. So this thing uh, would be one of those machines uh, which would be lovely to see, you know, in the French tech tree, just like it takes a really lovely place in the British tech tree. And yeah, I mean, why not? It, it is technically a French aircraft. It does have the 830 caliber machine guns and it is able to carry 2,000 of in, uh, internal bombs, 2,000 pounds, I should say. Uh, so yeah, why not? Would be a little bit of fun and already is in the game so it can't be too hard to move over 
The next vehicle we're having a look at is once again from Super Cacti, and this is talking about a Dutch vehicle, the Shelled S21. And there's actually some really lovely, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, 3D renders of this aircraft if you want to see what it was supposed to uh, look like right here. So what is this uh, Dutch machine? Well, as you can see, it's definitely an interesting design, which is kind of all over the place, which is wonderful. And and it's another one of those which was built by a shipbuilding company. Uh, so no one of those which was generally built by an aviation company, but very much similar to Blom and Voss, which of course were shipbuilders who built, uh, well, they didn't build a lot of German aircraft, but they designed a lot of weird and wonderful German aircraft. This is kind of the same deal for the Scheld. So the shipyard, which was conning uh, Max Schlapp de Scheld, which I'm sure I've said completely wrong in Wissingen, uh, started uh, aircraft construction in 1935 by taking over the estates of the bankrupt Nederlandsk uh, Fabriek uh, van Vliekent, H. Panda, and also Zonen, which included constructor Theo Slot and his team. And due, the, due to the economic crisis in the 30s, De Scheld was forced to expand its activities, whereby aircraft construction was regarded as an activity with a future perspective. Uh, they started with the design and construction of light sport aircraft, uh, such as the Scheld Munched and also the Scheld Mew, uh, single person, single engine aircraft with a thrust screw and the S-20, a four-person trainer aircraft with double tail boons and also a thrust screw. And by the end of 1938, Deschelder had finally presented the design of a fighter aircraft to the military aviation inspector uh, with a very progressive construction uh, for that time. The design was positively received, and some additional requirements and wishes were formulated from the military side with regard to layout and armament. Desheld uh, considered this feasible and ordered to build a prototype for its own account and risk. Then the Desheld S21 was born. It was a typical Theo slot design. It was an all-metal, single-person middle-decker with one rear engine with a thrust screw and double tail boons and a, a retractable landing gear with steerable nose wheel and large uh, piece of armor. The factory description explicitly states that the aircraft is easy and safe to fly and land for the average pilot. And in public sources from the time, there is uh, not a lot to be found about the aircraft. Uh, the uh, D-Telegraph of the 17th of March 1940 mentions it's under the heading bold creation on new roads but due to the military secrecy the newspaper can give few concrete details and uh, other than it was a revolutionary design so it was one of these things which uh, obviously was uh, kept incredibly secret even you know uh, apart from now at least we can see its whole design which is lovely and the s21 would be called a multi-role fighter plane in contemporary terms it was both a air defense fighter and also a fighter bomber against ground targets the s21 was also able to patrol for three to four hours at an altitude of 4,000 meters and a cruising speed of 350 kilometers per hour and the pilot was able to engage the autopilot to fully concentrate on his surveillance task the attacking of the enemy squadron bombers followed after radio telephone uh, reporting uh, own observations with a solitherm cannon in the nose. It had a 20 millimeter uh, pointing downwards at an angle of 25 degrees so that the aircraft did not have to dive and <laughs> could continue to fly at a constant height above the target. And <laughs> God damn it. Uh, for attacking accompanying enemy uh, fighter aircraft, the pilot had four fixed FN machine guns and then it was able to put the solitherm cannon into a horizontal position. So in the case of back attacks, the aircraft was also defended itself by diving lightly and uh, rising, uh, thus firing a vertically orientated fanfire with an FN machine gun facing backwards, the machine gun slot uh, through the hollow uh, propeller shaft. Uh, so that sounds incredibly dangerous, but a lot of fun. And with the downward facing cannon, trenches and other ground targets could also be fired upon. In addition, the S-21 was equipped with two bombs or loads of steel arrows, and the last provision still points to first world tactics. So you can see that this machine definitely uh, was an interesting one. There was a lot going for it when it came to uh, the, you know, 
and when it came to the overall Dutch design. And there's also links uh, in this post to all of the Benelux stuff, uh, which we've covered before, uh, which I would highly recommend, you know, you either watching or going to read about, because it's a lot of interesting information and does also include the wonderful S21. Anyway, that is the machines uh, for aviation that were passed to the developers in April of 2020. A lot of weird and wacky ideas, but always lovely to see. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Eugene's Terry, Daniel Stanton, Blackie, E. Love Goat, J. Wilt, Martinez, B. Young, Chris Giltnane, Trigger Hippie, Ambrosius McClellan, and also Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.